Welcome to the February 7th Open ZFS production user call. We have Jan, Stu, Rob, John, Greg, Dan, and myself. And we bantered on earlier about how do you define a production user? And there are some great ideas there uh, that you can peruse in the document. And I'll just try to scroll slowly enough that you can pause if you want to catch them. Nicely done. We also talked about events coming up and where one can discuss open ZFS topics. And without even saying it, I proposed a simple feature that Rob said, you know, that actually makes a lot of sense. And thank you for poking at that. So then Rob started in with uh, the fact that you seem to be working on NVMe related performance based on the fact that ZFS came out of like slow disks and making the most of them. Go ahead, Rob. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, so yes, I'm. I've been working on NVMe performance because, yeah, um, there's so much stuff inside ZFS that assumes that the disks will always be slower than anything we can do in code. So we have lots of time. Um, but as soon as you put NVMe under there and start trying to tune, um, and you run performance profiles, you find loads of things like running into the same lock, um. And yeah, consistently tanking your performance because you've just got all these threads waiting and waiting and waiting. So um, I don't have a lot to lot to really show other than the fact that um, I know where all the bottlenecks are. I know where the bodies bodies are buried. Um, and That's cool. um, it's a good start. Um, yeah, and 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 basically, it's like finding a hot lock and then figuring out how to disentangle it while still maintaining its uh uh sort of it's it's lockingness it's it's locking guarantees um is this that, go ahead sorry go on oh is that what's motivating this day job or personal passion? oh it's a it's it's sort of a day job well it is day job um it, it was it was where my initial interest in zfs development came from and then um nice. yeah i'm i'm at uh i'm at Clara now, so um, we oh, have cool. cu customers cu coming to us, and of course, it's easy to buy lots of NVMe these days. Yes, it so is. They turn up and they go, "I feel like this should be faster." So um, some of the things we're working on are just yeah, some are just straight out, straight out performance, like just go faster. Like they they want to see how close we can get to line speeds. Um, some are things like uh, like I have one customer who has. Um, a single, uh, their application is like a single multi-terabyte SQLite file, um, for better or for worse. But, uh, you know, these things often grow this way and they are finding that when they boot the system, they cannot, they, they have, uh, you know, many terabytes of memory in these machines, but they uh, can't, they can't get the entire file into the arc quick enough because they there's no there's no way there's no way to prime it from user space without running into a single file lock for example oh interesting um, so um and so we've got a few different projects related to that which will gradually find their way upstream but things like that once you run into very fast disks enormous amounts of memory um uh, yeah there's uh the things that were never supposed to happen start happening. So, so that that that's the abstract shape of 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 things. I, I'm I'm not actually being entire like, like I'm not trying to be discreet here. Like I can't give up things. I've just I've got to be careful of not going too hard because I will talk for three hours about a lock, and you will all be too polite to interrupt me. So um, <laughs> so there's that on actual uh uh. Uh, more feature-related work. Um, the fast dedupe has been a big, which I think has been mentioned around. And you've worked the on that place. Uh, yeah, that's been oh, a good chunk nice. of my work for the last year. So um, it's based on yeah, a designer, a lot of input from other people. But um, um, I wrote a lot of code for that, and I'm doing the sort of prepping the upstream at the moment. So um, nice. that will be interesting. It'll make should make. Well, it'll make dedupe usable, and it hopefully is a foundation for further improvement, which would be really nice. Absolutely, um, Rob. Yeah. When you you mentioned that you're familiar with that, could 
Um, is there a way to restrict it to certain data sets on a pool already? Because I haven't found anything uh, like that. So that um, I would only take even the reduced overhead for data sets where I expect some return on uh, the additional yeah, CPU the, memory investment. The, yeah, the dedupe property is uh, data set specific. The The dedupe table is pool wide, but you turn it on per, per no, data set. I mean the block level dedupe. Sorry. Oh, block cloning? Are we yes. slipping into oh, that? Block or are uh, you blocks. working, or did you mean the new new take on? Uh, yeah, I mean that. I, I'm yeah, the, I, I I mean dedupe dedupe the the fast dedupe that um, Alan Jude oh. and others have been talking about in the last few months. So that on 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 block cloning itself uh, per per data set block cloning. Um, yeah, we could do that. So Let me just have a look so, at that. let's say I have a data set where I know I'm only storing uh, my uh, web media or content which already is stored in a content ad uh, addressed manner that I know I won't get any data duplication on. For example, if I'm using Git Annex and treating the SSH SFTP search just as a content addressed store, I know that there is nothing to deduplicate on that data set. Okay. So so okay, so there's two. There's two. I'm still not entirely clear which one you're you're talking about. Uh, dedupe the tr to yes. just give me a chance to do yep. both. But um, dedupe the traditional uh, like automatic transparent yep. dedupe um, that can be turned on and off at the data set level, and that's transparent. You don't do anything for that. Block cloning. Block cloning de basically depends on, generally depends on what the application asks for, but you don't, like there's, there's, there's kind of minimal cost. Uh, so like it may not be, uh, what am I trying to say? I'm not, I'm not sure what thing you want to opt out of exactly that would make any kind of difference because are you are you copy basically are you copying that file those those, those objects um so sorry that's poorly constructed <laughs> what am yeah so put in you're not really opting into block cloning uh, explicitly because a bunch of tools you will use implicitly make use of it because it all happens through doing a copy file range, or at least on FreeBSD. Yeah. So uh, anytime you install a file using the install command, uh, certain uh, usage patterns with cat or maybe DD uh, can just run into this, but it just happens. Yes. And for some things that it's really a great feature, let's say, for example, if you could get it for copying a, a Postgres database, the whole, you have a, let's say a 300 gigabyte database and what used to take minutes to hours, depending on your storage, now takes milliseconds. Hmm. Because it's a bunch, it's a few dozen big files. Yep. And you have a question regarding block level Dido, which I have is that um, unless you're always using it for your existing data uh, and just rewrite the whole pool and so on, it would really be useful for me to have enough, a system call to point out content I expect to be deduplicated with. Like I expect these file range, these ranges and these two files to be identical. Please deduplicate them if I'm right. Yep. That so, is and um, that has to be sorry, atomic because I can't make sure that every file I want to deduplicate observe it's a locking protocol and there may be hard links so I can't just atomically replace a file either. So just really to without replacing the file and I note number and so on to just say 
here's some content I would like you to try to deduplicate. Tell me either if there's a false, yeah. I, I gave you invalid hint, if you mm -hmm. make some progress, if, and it, it's only a hint. So, yep. and so this would be I, useful for example, uh, where for things like install, it works, but for anything else I might do. Yeah, if there is some um, use so, uh, the copy file range system call, but I know that this file is identical. I could ju then just invoke some command with X arcs to just get the storage yep. back afterward. So yeah, so there is um there is work happening there. So on Linux there is a uh a well this is called uh ioctal called um uh five dedupe range which does exactly uh what you're saying. You say here are here are two file descriptors, two uh uh offsets mm -hmm. and two lengths. If they are the same, make them be the same storage. Um this uh and this is used there's some uh uh yes the 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 link that's just gone in the that we just put in the chat that's the the system call so that is Thank used you. by um there is a couple of there's a couple of tools that use that to do similar things so i think there is a pull request in to try mm -hmm. to implement some of that at the moment. Um, I haven't looked in on it. It's by someone else that haven't looked in on it for a while, but it seems like it will be very possible um, at least for certain cases, but we can certainly build that out. A question. So, so like, I think that will come in time, basically inside ZFS itself, a question mm -hmm. for you and for the, the, the FreeBSD brains trust is, um, since uh, FreeBSD only has copy file range at the moment as a way to to get at some of the cloning things, are there? How do we expose those those facilities on FreeBSD? They can so be ZFS. They could ways. be ZFS. Yeah, they could be ZFS specific uh, calls. I figure we could look at putting like you know five clone, five clone range, five digit range into the FreeBSD kernel. I mean, they are useful facilities, and I, you know, maybe we could do that patch there. I say we, like me, other interested people. Or, or we write we have FreeBSD specific tools that know how to invoke those, and I don't really know what is the most palatable or, or common path for the BSD world. So, yeah, you tell me. So, what I'm think, what I would like to use this for, for example, is to. Right now, uh, you, when you're templating out your jails for in FreeBSD, um, you will find very correct warnings to never use clone for anything but truly immutable deployments. Because all the advantages will turn sour over time with the first big update. All the savings will be gone, but all the downsides will be there. And the other problem is that unless you really make sure that you have the common descendants replicated and so on, you get into a whole lot of pain if before that whenever you try to move uh, one jail to another host, because then you have a dependency on the parent data set uh, or the origin data set of your clone and so on. And at the same time, the old school uh, DDAP isn't suitable for this kind of work because we're talking about small block sizes and it grows over time and you can dig yourself a really deep hole doing that. So because of that, I found that the only thing I can do with this workflow is to just do a fat copy, pay the storage overhead and accept the cost and it's an acceptable cost for what I get out of ZFS. Don't get me wrong, it works. But with the um, block level, uh, uh, block cloning, I would, I think it sh should be possible to get almost all of the advantages for this kind of workflow without the overhead of having to have any data structure which can handle the general purpose dedupe 
because I don't need the general purpose dedupe and having a little bit of overhead while I'm ra rolling out one jail would be totally acceptable so that I can have to write this out and then get the savings later. Or if I'm fast enough, maybe I write it out and while it's still in the arc, before I flush it to disk, I write in the data and then say, yeah, I think you can dedupe this here. And uh, if I run the race, it doesn't even get written to disk. Mm. Does I get? Would be really nice. But or similar to what uh, macOS does with the uh, uh, clone file system call, mm. which is a way right. to basically fork a file. <laughs> with, with Jan, with something like a here pause deduping for a period. Now, the problem with the existing dedupe feature is that I just can't accept the cost of the dedupe table in memory. OK. I was, uh, just, that, I was just thinking as throwing a, you know, throwing an argument at ZFS saying, hey, pause dedupe on this space for until I release it or 10 minutes. Yeah. My I know that the, the problem I foresee with a uh, user space managed dedupe for dedicated system calls is that it can explode the size of your snapshots. If you have a snapshot without block level rewriting, I don't see a way, uh, without block pointer rewriting, I don't see a way how you could uh, get back the storage when you take a snapshot before you do dedupe. But that's something you just have to work with. And yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. And uh, yeah, basically being able to just clone files so that, yes, uh, as it diverges, I want the performance. And over time, I want to get back the storage efficiency. Yeah. Mm. OK, no, these are good. These are good. Um... Thank so you. That's got, what I mean, other I mean, I'm not. I would like to be able to make. Yeah. All right. So low no, I... memory overhead, right performance as things change, and then storage efficiency can come back over time. Yeah. So, so these three things. Choose any three. No, I'm, I'm giving you crap. No, it's a. Uh, no, <laughs> it's uh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm joking. That no, it's, this is, uh, this is, this is the really of what's possible. Yeah, this is no. This is really good, and they're um, yeah. I mean, look, I I, I make no promises, and I of course not. Obviously, I'm not demanding but, um, any promises. Oh, you will for no, a fee. The, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'm, but, sorry. I'm, I, I, I'm a cheap day, yeah. no problem. Now, I do have. Look, I do. I th these are good. Getting use cases is really um useful for me for thinking about some of this stuff, and so um, and I. Like I like say the snapshots problem, uh, uh, the problem of of like getting rid of things out of um, old snapshots. I do have a couple of ideas um, around it, like like right. early early ideas, but which would also be able to help with potentially like the 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 problem of like uh, wanting to, you know, like uh, a legal thing that means you have to delete a particular piece of data forever out of all snapshots and things like that. I have some yeah, ideas uh... about how to do those sort of thing. It's basically you add, like it, it's cheesy as you basically you literally delete it, but then you leave a like an attached note that said, "Oh, you won't find these things here. Just pretend that they're there." Um, <laughs> like yeah. like, but but but, and then the the so it becomes kind of like an extra record type. But sort of overlaid it's like rather than sending this stream i send this stream with this metadata that helps you understand how to interpret the weird bits mm -hmm. um and i have not done redacted. any work on that I'm sorry, three very similar similar to redacted send except we also actually delete the thing or free up the blocks or whatever out of the the snapshot as well so it's not just don't send this it's right. Um, truly gone. Good. Yeah, this isn't there, so don't freak out when you don't find it. But obviously, there's so, a ton of edge cases. Like this, this is not code that's written. This is stuff that I've written, like a page of notes on for some day. Um, so the but, idea is to basically put in an overlay first, which says that 
to expect what would have been unrecovered. I will read errors there and then punch a hole and maybe either return IO errors without to the user space without uh, warning at the system level or the other way just pretending it's all zeros. Yes, something like, like punching that. Punching in sparse um, areas into files. Yeah, so, so, something like that. Um, sparse is a good idea, actually. Um, yeah, like so. So I guess what I'm saying is, I think those kind of problems are tractable, um, but I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have any plans to do them at this point because they're hugely invasive and uh, have you, uh... and and politically controversial, perhaps as well. So uh, these things take a little time. So I probably shouldn't mention them. But sorry, go on. <laughs> uh, well, if it's a pool flag and then a data set level to turn it on at all, and then. Uh... A pool feature you have to turn on, it has to be, and then you could uh, make it a property each exactly. data set has to opt in. That should get rid of most of the reasonable counters that it's a risk to data integrity, which it is intentionally that. Yeah. And, of and I think that's... that, and, and I think I think that's the thing. It's my it, all of this stuff is always just getting the user interface right so that uh, people understand when they're um, turning the safeties mm -hmm. off. Um, and, and I have no problem with that. I mean, because it comes up over and over and over again, doesn't it? So it's like, well, clearly this would be something would be a benefit. Um, we shouldn't just say no. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. so, yeah. So, 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 and then, yeah, if we did that, if we did a facility like that, right, then um, uh, it could potentially be used for also um, uh what we were saying about uh, cloned or duplicated blocks in in snapshots as well to be able to get back the uh, the storage. Um, so so for... it's it, it, it's good to have a second kind of use case for a possible feature like that. I like it. So for uh, FreeBSD 14 with the new uh, jails include feature, I prototyped out an idea how I can uh, use ZFS read only clones to get kind of the behavior of whiteouts at a directory level through data sets so that I can have the layered images without ever materializing basically the, um, the nesting because I keep it at the file system level so that I can swap in, in and out the middle layers without having to recreate everything. Mm, nice. Uh, basically, I can have a per FreeBSD version of the user land for the jails, I have a full user land, three or four gigabytes before compression. Then I take a snapshot of that. Um, I clone it read only. If I, during startup of the jail, I notice that I'm missing a mount point directory during my jail pre-start logic, it will quickly mount the data set writable, create the mount points and then snapshot it and make it read only again mm. so that I can have basically stateless clones. They may have a few changes, but the diff is only the creation of directories from on points so that it can get recreated on demand. So it's still immutable mm. as in I can destroy it, recreate it, and it won't change at runtime. And then I can use that and have my uh, packages as the same way. The problem is that it became very unwieldy when uh, trying to automate that the first time, because now I may have uh, persistent data I want to not wipe out on an update of the application. And it's a child data set of something I want to replace. So that I had to kind of move the uh, old data sets away, recreate the tree as required by either renaming the children or um, yeah, just basically cre recreate the data set tree. Uh, and that was hard to automate, but the best thing I found so far to fix that is to keep an unmountable parent to just make, basically to turn the parent child relationship into a sibling or relationship with a, just a placeholder as the top level parent for each type of data basically 
base system packages and uh, persistent data. And then just, and it's uh, documented in the back in the minutes of the jails call, what I did there. And Jan, has your strategy changed any since that, or have you added any no. tools to automate that since then? No, uh, okay. that's one of the things I um, was hacking on, just making that easier to use and deploy. Yeah, keep us posted on that, especially but as that's tools emerge. Server, it's, it, the problem is, again, like similar things. The mechanisms are there. Yeah. The opinionated enough tooling to be user-friendly is missing. <laughs> Yeah, there was a lot going on there, and it takes quite a bit to wrap one's head around what you had going on. And hey, anything you can do to communicate it to us slower and, people is appreciated. Yeah, because right now I can get by without even an LFS. Oh, uh, interesting. And I don't need, uh, and I really want to avoid the need to ever look at the union FS as is in FreeBSD, because with the VFS, this is never going to be reliable, I think, cool. until we can lock the right 10 people into a room for a month and force them to think it all through. Yeah, well, that's called BSD can hallway track it best. <laughs> no, no. No? Okay. There they mention what each one of them knows why it doesn't work right now, mm. not how do we get that fixed and committed and not just... Uh, Discussed and lost. Review with rejected ideas. Well, document, document, document. Anything else today? Greg, John, other challenges you bumped into? So Nothing maybe... uh, show stopping. Um, yeah. I, I am looking at a very full file system that we haven't uh, augmented yet. And I was, I was going to ask, um, you know, with most file systems, it's never good to run them too full. Oh, excuse me. And uh, I was going to ask, is the concern with ZFS uh, data corruption or is it just performance related? Uh I'll go first and say performance. The allocator, as I understand it, changes at 80% fill. And I call it the holiday parking lot problem. <laughs> In February, the parking at the mall is like great and available, but uh, I don't know, December 22nd in some countries, it is like a nightmare. And mm -hmm. ZFS is just looking for contiguous places to put data. And Rob, take it from there, because I could be off base. <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat the question again? Oh, uh, the pool behavior with a, a full pool. Are as there... the pool fills up, yeah. what do you have uh, to yeah. expect? Yeah, but basically your your performance is going to drop off. Um, uh, ZFS will do things like, um, because it, uh, so there's the delayed freeze. It's not called delay free. It's called delay yeah. something else. But basically when you free a block, there's kind of, it's put, a, it's put on a list and they get freed sort of later in the background um, to kind of keep performance good. So it will start more aggressively trying to free up space that way. Um, when it gets into really kind of degenerate cases where the pool is very fragmented, um, it uh, the allocator will say, oh, I couldn't find a, you know, I have this, uh, I have this, uh, well, 4K is a bad thing because then we start thinking about A shifts. But um, say we're on a, on a, uh, a shift nine pool, so a 512, because a lot of the code still thinks of things that way. Um, and you might say, Oh, I've got this 4K um, write that I want to do, or three and a half K. Say, I've got this bigger than 512 that I want to do, um, but I can't find that much space. So it will then start, it will do a thing called, uh, it'll start to build what's called a gang block, which is, um, uh, it, it's named after the, the, the old like mainframe plugs where you sort of gang chain things together where basically it will make a little 512 byte block and then it'll make little oh, 512 yeah. <laughs> little five, 512 allocations and they will point to that and they might have 
another game block and this sort of thing, and it'll basically make a single logical block out of all these little pieces of disk, um, which means you get your storage, but that completely tanks your performance because you've got mm. tiny, tiny uh... little things. And that is part of what your fragmentation uh, uh, number is is conveying to you. So, um, so yeah, and I mean, look, eventually you'll get Eno space and um, your pool will suspend. <laughs> like yeah. there, there's there, there's limits so it, it tries really really hard but um but yeah um but the discs are butterflying a lot i guess yeah and yeah. even before that what happens is that allocation performance kind of tapers off as you're pulling in more and more meter slabs uh, for yes. the allocator because yes, you're scanning point. through more and more allocation areas so Mm. The way I understand it from a, just a curious glance is that you kind of keep a, the uh, allocator state isn't too, that cheap. So you don't have one big allocator per disk, but you split the disk yep. up into like 200 sub allocators and keep only mm. some of them around and you cycle through them to make good use of the disk over time. And as the allocation sub allocators become less and less able to service your requests. You have to scan more of them, and that means you have to pull them in, deserialize the data structure because it's indexed differently on disk and in memory. And so yep. you notice that the kernel threads you didn't know about suddenly show up on top. <laughs> yeah. And when things like yeah, when every write is requiring a lot of reads to just service them, um, that really starts to hurt. And um, there are like this stuff is better in in like uh, in two point two particularly. Uh, some of the the like we're not quite so hasty to eject meta slab tables from memory, um, just because we didn't find anything we needed there. And I think you can also make meta slab, you can configure meta slabs to be bigger because. Oh, I can't remember which version it was, but at some point they were pegged to like each one covered about 200 meg of disk. And of course, then disk get a lot, lot bigger and suddenly you have tens of thousands of these damn things. I think um, if but I remember I... correctly, the kernel tries to, or uh, the implementation tries to allocate a certain number per disk so that you have a certain oh. fan out ratio and that's around 200. Oh, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. I can't remember. We've been doing so, some work there which recently. Which is one of the and, downsides but, but we had... of uh, increase, basically growing a disk. So if you have a virtual machine, which starts out with a 10 gig yes. uh, virtual it's... disk, and then mm. you grow that for 200 gig, then a terabyte. That's right. 10 terabytes. It's... You have literally because these it's... parameters. It's fixed, can't be at, it's fixed at VDEV creation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, oh, right. Hmm. So um, I think we had a customer that had like, 15,000, like tens yeah. of thousands of meta slabs and this is the thing. But once you start getting up into like petabyte size pools, it becomes complicated. That's not necessarily a problem if you've got the memory, but um, yeah, there's improvements there as well. Um, and also sequential performance. Like if, if even if there is space on the disk for your, you know, your one megabyte file, but your uh, 128K blocks are here, 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 um, it becomes... A, a lot more seek time to do prefetching and stuff. So basically, yeah, where the pool gets full, um, it you can expect performance to oh, sure. yeah. um, drop, it, it drop off. You've kindly I confirmed found, that for us. Go ahead. Yeah. I found oh. a few uh, production use that it only happens when you rewrite in different block sizes a lot. So just deleting a bunch of files and then rewriting them. And as long as you're making use of big allocation blocks, like you have a disk you use to exchange big video projects on. And it gets commonly filled up, but it's not a problem because you're always writing out big files and then deleting some of them. And you're always asking for one megabyte uh, blocks and some fragments at the end of the file basically and then performance stays good even if you repeatedly run the pool up to capacity delete a few files and do it again 
Um, so it's really the fragmentation of the allocator, which is the problem. Hmm. You are forcing if you keep, let's say, a database and a file server running on the same pool and fill up the pool. Are there but, formulas for users? There's been a whole lot of sort of, I don't know, voodoo suggestions, random use this in this circumstance, but I'd love to see this all be a little more scientific and spelled out for people. The allocation overhead, the deduplication overhead is per block. So get Allocations. bigger blocks if you can afford them. Interesting. So Greg, what I would like to benchmark yeah. and measure, but don't have the tools to really do right now is what is to look at how a D rate interacts with special allocation classes. Hmm. So for example, having a D rate with one Mac blocks works, but then you kind of, for if you're having lots of old spinning disks in a JBot somewhere, you kind of need a few SSDs to the side for the metadata operations because OS latency sucks for most operations, even if bulk IO throughput is acceptable. And they get basically rule of thumb, scaling formulas, and what makes sense? Does it make sense to have an S log and special allocation classes or both or is one good enough? How much metadata do you need? Sure. Cool. Greg, did you have one last thing? I heard you for a sec there. Yeah, I was I was just gonna mention um so we have eight uh V devs uh of ten disks in uh, one JBOD and I have another eighty disk JBOD sitting out in the um corridor that we're going to be rack mounting and augmenting this full file system with. I was just wondering, would it be worth it to write a script to read and rewrite files to like balance it out over to VDEVs or will ZFS handle the newfound storage appropriately or any best be practices on that? Rebalance, uh, speaking from experience. Say Maybe again, I John, sorry. From experience, at least uh, older versions of ZFS were very slow to rebalance because it will only basically bias right allocations to the faster, emptier um, VDEVs. Right. So yeah. um, it will never move the uh, existing data unless it gets rewritten. So you have to give it a chance to. Uh, so if you want to have read performance improvements as you add more VDEVs over time, you have to rewrite the data. Okay. And hence his question. But I, uh, all that, I know is it's improved with. The warning I have to add to that is that doing so gives you giant snapshot deltas. Naturally. Because the snapshots track the allocations, not the content. So right. that means if you rewrite the same content, it does not get you any clever deduplication advantages, unless you, but I don't think for that kind of setup, you won't be able to afford a dedup table to hold all of that. Are you using snapshots in that situation? I, I am using snapshots. We're not using a dedupe though. Mm -hmm. But yeah. if you have lucked out and used lots of data sets, or at least a few dozen or so, um, you can do it per data set over time. And then you can, be, uh, and unless you have to preserve the snapshots for a long time and can't afford to recreate it. And if you basically double the capacity, what you could try is to start a new history and then kind of migrate to the new device, set it up as a D rate with big blocks and compression as you would have wanted to or something and then use your old drives at the end after the migration of the whole pool. If you're doubling capacity or more, you can do that. And then we have the old drives like you would have done with the new ones, but that gives you a, a chance to basically clean up all your historical mistakes. Sounds good. Thank you, John. Or suboptimal decisions. <laughs>
Cool. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a mistake. Less than ideal. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Thank you. But you can only do that when you at least double your effective capacity. Yeah, that's that's what we'll be doing. Uh, I'm probably just going to write a script to rewrite. Do if you're but if you're using Red Z, you can't. But with uh, mirrored storage, if you can take any chances with it, you can st start out with a uh, burn-in test for the new devices, then uh, purely stripe pool, and then later add uh, the mirror pairs. But that's, uh, yeah, hmm. that's a hacky way to uh, do it. Jan, Maybe. would a send help to just send from one data set to another on the same pool? Would that just aggressively re so, outlet, redistribute and then you just destroy, destroy the original? That should uh, do everything unless you're using the duplication. That is exactly what you can do in the... And because Greg, by scripting, is, did you have a send in mind or just copying some data? Send and receive uh, works fine or just over basically write, rewriting the storage in place also works. Doing the send and receive has the nice advantage that it gives you new data sets so that you kind of can keep the history. Mm -hmm. Oh, good point. Uh, because you're, as you send and receive to the same pool, you still keep the history yeah so, i don't then think you uh, have to have the bandwidth for your uh any system replicated of that to also do replicate this new hit history but at least you preserve the history yeah fair points um this is a a second copy of our production data so um while snapshots are great and whatnot um i think i could handle uh them not being optimal for the for the duration of, of the rewrite if that's the way we go. And if you have a redundancy to fault it, maybe just treat it as a catastrophic loss and recover to it. If I wouldn't do that for the first two copies, but maybe for the third. Fair enough. Yeah. I do have a tape library too, so <laughs> yeah. Just it depends on how much bandwidth and what's your change rate and so on. Yeah. Do the napkin yep. math on what you can <laughs> afford to do and what it gets you. And once you've done it, maybe come back and ask others to double check your uh, results. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Thanks again. Okay. Well, anything else? Rob, I think the issue I found at the Dev Summit has been fixed. I was working with uh, native encryption just prior to the event, and there was like a reference to, say, one type of cipher and no listing of the others. So it was quite confusing until I realized when they split out the manual pages, uh, the references to props didn't get included in the encryption ones. But that, again, appears to be resolved. So thank you, whoever did that. So, uh, Rob, you mentioned uh, yeah. working on NVMe uh, performance. How mm -hmm. uh, aggressive are mm -hmm. your goals? So, are you working on finding the mm -hmm. next uh, hot lock and splitting it up, or are you really tackling architectural designs like dedicating a certain subset of a CPU course to just pulling the uh, submission and completion queues uh, and just cha changing the size of that set depending on load or something like that, which would be um, on the extreme a few, <laughs> Yeah, a few, a few things. Um, at the moment, mostly focusing on hot locks um, because like there's a lot of low hanging fruit. But what I did do in the middle of last year is I wrote a... Um, I wrote a new kind of, well, not not I invented it, but like um, I wrote I implemented like a lock free queue uh, and replaced all the I O queues with that, um, and 
that went really well, but overall performance went slower because I ran into then ran into a hot lock further up the stack. Um, yeah. So so I put that work aside because I'm like, okay, there are architectural changes that are possible, and I have like I have ideas at every point on like the extreme, you know, kind of scale. So, but um, but for the moment, it's mostly. Um, better tuning and and locking and that sort of thing. I'm not the only one doing work in this area. Um, like Master has some work for like parallel data set sync, which changes some IOQ stuff. There's a couple of patches in recent 2.1 and 2.2 releases, which lets you tune certain elements of the um, the IOQs, which used to be hard coded, um, which sometimes allows you to say, "I want I want more threads for this type of IO." Um, and things like that, uh, but they're mostly there as like experimental uh, options to exp options to experiment with on particular production sites with a view to updating the hard coded tuning. So, like, so it's that kind of work to start because yeah. there is just so so much of it. But like the one I've been focused on at the moment is, and I might go on too long, but. The one we focus on at the moment is the the VDEV Q lock. So um, every IO you send gets pushed onto a series of a series of internal queues, and that's where aggregations are built. So if you have multiple small writes, we'll actually hold them for a little while, like like a few milliseconds, because we might be able to coalesce them into mm -hmm. a single write and send that down to the device. So delayed allocation. Um, yeah, to like UFS uh, does. Yeah. Client, not not allocation. This is actually grouping things so we can submit it to the device in one hit if we know that it's a single contiguous run. So there's only one uh one head, one sweep of the head kind of thing. Um, so we'll just hold them for just a moment. But that stuff's all under. There's a single lock for every mm -hmm. physical device, and that lock gets taken on the way in where we mm -hmm. take the IOs, and then on the way back where we say these are completed. Um. Ouch. And and so like that thing is that's the one I keep running into. Like that thing is white hot once the discs are fast. <laughs> um and, dis and disentangling that is difficult um because we genuinely need to look through this broad variety of things and pick and choose the pieces we want and assemble the things. So we need other people to back off while we do that. Um uh, yeah. So but like I've done half of that. So by which I mean I've moved some stuff out from under that single lock and I'm seeing about a 4% performance increase on rights, Could on a heavy write, heavy write workload. And, by... Let him finish. Let him finish. Sorry. Go ahead, Rob. And that's, and that's like, I have not removed the global lock yet. We are still running mm -hmm. into the global lock. So just moving some of the work out from under it is already yielding an improvement. So I'm hopefully only a couple of ways from having that, a couple of weeks away from having that broken, but then I have to ensure that I haven't stuffed anything because the moment you take the locks off um you're in high danger zones and yeah so um but in terms of architectural changes like I've got a vague idea that I would like it <laughs> like I'm conscious of the time and I don't want to uh, go ahead too far it, well, down rabbit hole. Um, audience, well okay you want to hear this or you do not I think it's all good I, because I, we, I, we, I like to hear we only see this <laughs> as a behavior on a system not like why it's like that. So I think it's fantastic. Go uh, ahead. Rob? Right. Well, I, I, I will, I'll, sorry, go on. Just my first idea would be to just take anything you consider out of the queue onto a basically aggregation queue and then resubmit the larger batch. So that I don't think like along those lines, but. Yeah, the, the hard part comes in with, uh, right priorities uh if you've if if you're queuing up it's hard but if you're queuing up like async rights for an aggregation and mm -hmm. then async right comes along and you're like well i'm going to that like oh. that has to take priority i'm going to that spot on the disc i'll bring all the async rights with me that are nearby yep. um because we might as well do them while we're there but i have to go first so um mm -hmm. uh, so it's just it's those kind of considerations that are already in the code. Um, mm. So I want to make sure I don't damage any of that stuff. So like I think it's possible. It's just super fiddly, but yeah. the um, 
But the way that IO queues broadly work is they're modeled after like a an old like an old timey like interrupt service routine. Like um mm -hmm. you you issue work like down one pipe and then you kind of get the result back on like literally an interrupt handler and it's how it, it picks up. So there is issue, high priority issue, interrupt, high priority interrupt. And then there's one for each type of thing for like reads, writes, uh, trims, freeze, so I optimal. Tons of context switches. Yeah. And then within each one of those sort of, if you imagine that as a table, it's literally a table in the code. Each one of those cells then has some number of queues. And then at the end of each of those queues, some number of threads. Okay. So it's kind mm -hmm. of this, it's kind of this, I don't know, X, Y, you know, M, N, O kind of combinatorial mm -hmm. model. <laughs> and each one of those executes a single stage of the IO path. A yeah. stage of the IO path can be allocate a block can be compress or encrypt this so a cpu heavy load or can be send this to the disk and these things aren't particularly well differentiated and then there's some parts in the code will just go ah oh, this queue is kind of full i'll just warp it over to that one because i know that that one's unused even though this is not its purpose hmm. so you end up with this kind of lots of things bounce around a lot it's not like a nice linear pipe and again, like I say, that didn't matter when the disks were slow, <laughs> when your computer was always faster than the disks, but we're not there anymore. So the architectural place that I'm going in my head, and this is like, if if I got to do it entirely my own way at entirely my own pace, I'm getting here in, in a couple of years. So I like, this is high speculation, but I feel like the, the, the model I want for ZFS internally is as close as possible just to, from a straight line from your IO operation, uh, sorry, your user syscall to the drive with as little chopping and changing on the way through, except that sometimes it's necessary. So, but, yeah. but maybe it's, maybe it's like, rather than saying these things are split by reads and writes more, these things are split by compute intensive stages versus IO intensive stages. And maybe that's where we start to sort of say, well, actually this PCI device is connected here on the CPU die. Um, and this is its local, like, you know, it's, it's sort of NUMA style. This is its local memory. And I kind of bind these pieces together so I can say, okay, I have a, the checksumming thread and the IO for that device and the memory that it will use are all local and don't have to go cross CPU or things like and that. It gets even um, more complex when you have offloading engines for things like checksum. Indeed it does. So, um, so yeah, like at the moment, I don't have much more than like a mass of ideas of shapes and about 10,000 browser tabs. Um, so, and, and also I don't like, there's a degree to which this represents like a rewrite of ZFS and I'm not, opposed to that philosophically but if that is the direction then like it has to be it has to come at that with that framing like i like that is the approach i would need to take like i am actually working over here on a different kind of zfs optimized for a particular kind of performance i don't know if that's true i don't know if that's necessary um it's really far too early for me to Okay, so at the moment, I'm just doing the low-hanging just... fruit, which is what my customers have asked for anyway, so that's okay. Um, but just trying to chart out what I think is the right direction because NVMe is fine, but, um, you know, what happens when we've got, you know, I don't know, holographic storage or whatever the hell the next thing what is. is next, yeah. um, w at some point, we're going to need to tackle this. So having an architecture that supports that is... Fine. But fortunately, there is so much performance left on the table right now. Um, it should be very uh, straightforward to get nice incremental improvements for a very long time yet. Well, there's we a very thank you massive... There's a very John. mass... I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. I said, I said, and we thank you for it, in case it hasn't been said. In case it hasn't said. Go what, ahead, John. What... Yeah. Uh, I was just going to... Well, Rob, thank you. I was going to say there's a huge performance difference. You know, if you're going through an HBA card, you know, a, a Broadcom 93XX or, you know, 9400s or whatever they have now um, versus, you know, you go order a system that's got, uh, you know, 16 uh, NVMe drives across the front of it. 
um, the the performance of, of, of those systems is just massively different. Um, and then I wanted to, Rob, I wanted to personally congratulate you. Um, and I'm showing my age here. You had me thinking about in days gone by when I used to write uh, channel programs. And <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with that stuff, but you would submit a channel program and then somebody would come along and request a block and you would calculate where it was. So you would go in and dynamically change the currently executing channel program if it hadn't actually gotten to the IO request that you were asking it to deal with. So there you go. You you managed to take me back a, a number of years. <laughs> well, I'm glad. And, and you know, like everything old is new again. That stuff's coming back. We're now getting NVMe drives where you can actually load code onto the device. So uh, part of our thinking needs to be, well, do we need to offload certain kinds of processing directly into the, um, into the yeah. drive? And what does that mean? So it's like, you know, like, you know, maybe in a short amount of time you'll be, uh, you know, you'll be the local expert on on that stuff because um, I only I only read about it. I'm I'm still a so, baby. Uh, <laughs> there are um, NVMe drives with really big FPGAs on there. Mm, they so cool. Uh, as in uh, the biggest thing uh, you can could have bought at the time, or one less one number smaller, and like four gigs of local DRAM on the drive. I've only seen them once, but it's tempting what to think what you could do with that. Uh, similar to old timey uh, channel programs where you could just ask it to read a bunch of blocks, but you could actually branch depending on the results so that you could basically do a read uh, in a record oriented file system on a B tree and search through the B tree with a just by key. Yeah, that's correct. Without... You're dealing with count, yeah, it's all count key data stuff. Yeah. I've only seen that at vintage computing events where people show what you can get out of a ridiculous low clock speed by just not oh, I like that doing the CPU in like uh, yeah. cycles. Uh, it's intensive context switches and interrupts, but just running it uh, on the channel processors. Um, but even with less extreme things, I think the obvious ways uh, to offload things are almost every modern SSD will have a compression engine already on there to get, uh, because compression uh, is very valuable to them because it is, it claws back blocks for rare leveling and it implicitly avoids long runs because any dense coding will not have long runs without transitions. So that, and uh, then they, the more expensive ones have encryption engines too because you can't do uh, the compression and deduplication after uh, encryption that is worth a damn. So you want to offload compression to the disks, you kind of have to offload uh, encryption. And at that point, your block device no longer has a fixed capacity, which will break so many assumptions that it's not even funny. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, uh, on the more boring side, because I, in the real world, I'm stuck at least a generation earlier when it comes to storage. So I'm still running hybrid pools with spinning disks and SAS or uh, SATA SSDs, uh, which is what is the uh, state of the art when it comes to si basically per VDEV Q depths for different types of operations because you can't really have one uh, number of read or write skewed per uh, pool or if you have different media types in the same pool, for example. Uh, that, yeah, uh, definitely was an issue tuning per type. Go ahead, well, especially if you have two pools in one system, go ahead. Or even uh, if you have special allocation class devices, 
which are NVMe or SATA, and you have still spinning disks for your big, large blocks. And you really want a different number of reads queued. So let's say you want 10 or 20 async reads queued on your spinning disks to fully load them with reasonable latency, but for your NVMe, 200 or if even 500 is the problem, but is what makes them fly. Because otherwise they're so fast that you're ping-ponging between drive and CPU all the time. Because the queues are just too short. Rob, so, any feedback on the state of the art in that regard? I assume there have been some gradual improvements. Because if um, I remember correctly, uh, per VDEV uh, properties haven't really been released yet for that, right? Uh, uh, not for that, I think. Like, per VDEV properties exist, but they're not all uh, hooked up um, into those kind of things. No, there's still a global tunable, like like a, a, a module-wide, system-wide uh, uh, tunables for different priorities and different queues. And as you say, that is a challenge when you have different types of devices and multiple pools in the system. Multiple pools in the system is is absolute chaos in terms of IO scheduling. Um <laughs> because all the all those Q things I mentioned before, they are not um they are pool wide, not system wide. So every pool gets its own queues and its own threads. Um, they're nice. So, um, I got a customer where they perform. They usually run seven pools per machine, and oh, really? performance profile is very different when they go from six to seven. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyway, um, all one type of media or a mix of spinning disks and flash. Uh, all one type of media. Unfortunately, okay. they're all they're all it's seven times fourteen wide, raid Z three. So. Oh. Don't yeah, these are, okay. These wow. are enormous machines. Um, oh, we have found some very good bugs out of these and some very good performance out of these. <laughs> no, which we're all tri we're great. slowly trickling back upstream. But yes, these uh um these uh parameters that uh Jan is posting in the chat right now, yes, those are those are what we have and they're global and they are once you get into mixed devices as we've seen, um uh, it uh, becomes difficult. There are a couple that I think have a distinction between uh, rotational and non-rotational devices, but it's all a bit fiddly. Um, uh, just being able I get... to assign a class, basically, or whatever a, a speed mm. category to a to disk mm. or VDEF, and then ha having a copy of this global for each of the Let's say normally you wouldn't have need more yeah. than three of the speed classes because at most you have NVMe uh, hardware RAM disk or something then Optane whatever then your media quality flash and then your spinning trash. Uh, That's a really interesting idea. Yeah. What if we had? So, what if, what yeah? What if we had per you you just give and, each. VDEV a named thing, and that corresponds to a collection of configuration variables that override and others. You could really nicely uh, auto detect the class by just seeing if it reports a rotational speed. Yeah, right. There's and so we, so we start off. With... Yeah, we start off with just a rotational and non-rotational class, which we kind of vaguely have a concept of internally, um, yeah. and then we give you hooks to be able to fiddle with those or make more. So it's almost mm -hmm. like a like profiles, like device profiles kind of thing. Yep, and uh, just tweeted <laughs> basically as poison, so per VDEV, the slowest class or something. So because you you're, mean, when you're tuning this, you probably don't care. Sorry, John? Be nice. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get John's uh, uh, comment. It was my typo in the display. You're probably uh, not rightfully not watching along. Go ahead. <laughs> So these would be grouped per pool, per B VDEV, per data set, uh, for what? So the, I think the, the idea I just came up with would maybe, I don't know how the code structures be 
make it possible to just index of this the type of media basically and that could stay global it would just be multiplex to a free ray so that it's a tiny amount of additional state and storage uh, it stays global so you wouldn't have to re-architecture anything you just need an index to index into the two or three copies of this business and if it's really limited to three because i don't I can't come up with a realistic production deployment where you have more than three speeds of media in a single system. Mm. So where we need more than three speed differentiations in a single machine. Mm. So it would yeah. be something like maybe four if you have remote block storage. Yeah, but you may and want to prioritize different devices in different ways as well i'm not but, I'm, yeah. I, I i i guess i'm saying uh what's the old thing about like you know you write your code to support one thing two things or in things so yeah. um w once we get to three we're supporting a thousand if potentially if you want it which is um, which is fine but, like i can totally see how to uh, how to assemble that um but just f really hard uh, upper compiled in limit to four so that you can still pre-allocate what gets pre-allocated and so on would s solve all of my <laughs> needs and, and all of the needs I can foresee for normal deployment, except for very exotic corner cases where you really come up with a way how you can make it a problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree. Four sounds like about the right amount. Four is often a good number for, for um, baked in defaults. And so, uh, yeah, it's if so you interesting. just treat it yeah. as a basically a any VDEF as the one of the slowest member by default. Yep. And then you mm. just need to annotate this. Yeah, that. And I don't know how you would, what would be the best way to get it in. But the nice thing is that the two most important classes, basically, flash or spinning, you yeah. for bare metal you can auto detect that because as far as I know, all the common ways to attach spinning disks to anything where you care about performance. So I'm not counting cheap USB to SATA adapters or trash like that. will report that this is a spinning disk by just re reporting yeah. the RPM and if, or a variable or something, but even there they report a number and for any yeah. variable RPM disk I've seen, uh, even if it's yeah. not correct. I mean, and you can the even- flash will all read as zero, so. Yeah, you can even do adjustments and things if you wanted to have like an automatic class selection kind of thing. Like right now, uh, like the stuff we do with the, um, with the right throttle where we don't, we assign rights, well, we assign IO, uh, we assign rights to devices based on the speed at which they can accept them so um yeah you so you're so yeah finish. so you could so you could be watching looking at the performance profile and just saying yeah okay that that disk says it's an ssd but it's junk i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah. not hit, hurt it so hard but i mean once you have the structure for that um like did you say qvo <laughs> i as in samsung <laughs> Yes. Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Mm. Fair enough. Yeah. So, so yeah, but I mean, it, in, ter in terms of it's, it's trash. Mm. Yeah. I didn't finish. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, um, anyway, I think, I think that, I think those sort of things are quite possible to mm. do. Um, I mean, huge amount of work. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not, and I'm not going to be working on it anytime soon. I will absolutely be thinking about it. Um, oh. um, I will say to anyone on this, call if you are in an organization that um is interested in any major features uh uh, um, uh is this okay michael <laughs> yes go for it um, it's no secret. i was gonna say it, <clears throat> i was gonna say if 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 you are in an organization who is interested in major features or um zfs support you should contact clara systems um which is who i work for and um we do major feature development i dabble around the edges myself which is why i write you know 
an extra option to dash T. The dash. But, <laughs> um, <you>. but, uh, <laughs> I've got but, uh, cents in my pocket. I can, I can. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but yeah, like this will happen in a couple of years, maybe if it's left to me on my own time. Um, but if you're like, yeah, I want that and I want it now, come talk to us. If you want it to become even uh, harder to do, you could keep a histogram, basically a histogram of IO latency and throughput, and then specify classes to VDEFs matching the performance characteristics. Yes. Like if you, and then yeah, maybe look at, take a look at the idle time as well so that you don't uh, account idle time. So anytime the, the device is loaded at all, it has these performance characteristics and for perf devices with this performance characteristics as in write latency, read latency, uh, IOPS, uh, read write, match this class to it. But now you're... Uh, you yeah. are speaking my language. Self-tuning is like the best thing ever and i love it so okay. yes um yes that is the crazy world i will end up in anyway <laughs> but well, it's so much um, harder than just uh picking uh reasonable defaults for the devices you expect to encounter the next five years cool uh yeah do sleep on that i'm sure <laughs> You'll have a shower thought that answers what the future will look like for auto tuning based on device type in ZFS. Yeah, auto tuning a Q depth based on latency would be great. But it's a, my worry as a user would be that it's kind of non deterministic. So, do I really want the Q depth to drop out because I have a partially broken device. For example, I've had the uh, rest of digital uh, red drives fail in such a way that they wouldn't ever fail a request, but would take up to two seconds to uh, service a single read request. Hmm. It's not enough to trigger the deadman switch, but it is enough to drive you crazy under uh, medium loads because very low loads it kind of is noticeable if you have one or two dying devices in your pool but under medium or spiky loads it becomes crazy because suddenly HTTP requests time out because the back end uh, is stalled and you just look at your pool no my pool isn't really loaded for IO because yeah, no wonder, because everything is blocked on the single sync write, the dying device uh, pulled from the write queue. So, damn rock stealing queues. <laughs> on that note, like, subscribe, and donate. I thank you all. It's okay, I'm going to call it. I can be around a few minutes, but the sun came out, so I may have to address that. Ars Technica, critical vulnerability on oh boy okay uh greg does that apply to zfs i'll throw oh, it in no, there sorry just uh, no so worries no it's... never no apologies uh, information that is important to you is important to all of us wait until the end of the week and throw that in there <laughs> breaking uh, i'll just throw that in there hey cool i did see it fly on some uh, news Feed. So anyway, thank you everybody. Have a great oh, one. The, is this about the UEFI uh, boot splash image exploits and so on? Yes. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah it's, it's a few days old. Yeah, you need to be you you know a pix not pixie boot but booting off of a HTTP for it to be a thing, which probably isn't going to affect a huge amount of people. Not your average um, user. Yeah. At least one of them was just a JPEG header parser exploit for even local storage for the splash screens. Save it for the security call. Not that yeah. it exists yet. Okay. <laughs> like, subscribe. Talk to you soon. Have a good day, guys. Take care. See Bye, everyone. See you later.